The meeting has come to order. Uh, I'll stand for the invocation. Uh, Councilor Nofire, would you like to lead us? Yes. Heavenly Father, we just come for you today and we thank you for all your many blessings. Uh, we thank you that we're all here uh, together to do uh, your will and, and make your will be uh, for the Cherokee Nation and have your hand blessed upon them and blessed on everyone here. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Entertain a motion. Anybody second? All approved. Say aye. Aye. Okay. First up, Claremore Service Unit. George Valour. Valour. Better, huh? Valour. He changes every night. Sounds like a company name, George. I'm trying to focus on Cherokee. I mean, I, I'm trying here. You can check it back. Yeah, George. George, can we name you something in Cherokee? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be good. Thank you. How are you today, George? I'm doing good, thank you. How are things at Claremont? We're doing good. Um, first off, we've got we've had uh, 49 positive cases of influenza. Mm -hmm. Only one that uh, needed to be admitted. Uh, last month in uh, de in December, we saw 616 patients in dental, uh, 2,604 in uh, lab. Uh, set a new high in outpatient pharmacy for the month. We filled 30,461 prescriptions on the outpatient side. Uh, mail order stay is constant with uh, 10,500 uh, enrolled in the mail order program. Uh, and radi and radiology had almost 2,500 patient encounters. Collections are doing well, so uh, things, <coughs> things are... Uh, Steady in Claremont. Very good. Anybody have any questions? George, I, ha I have something I wanted to ask. You told me that you all are budgeted to on, on contract health. How much was that a month? It, it fluctuates. Um, Approximately? Uh, we Yearly we get, a, we get <clears throat> just over $7 million. Um, so we break that down by week. And then as we put in for chef money, the catastrophic money um, and, and money that uh, we get back from insurance put back into the system, that it fluctuates between, say, 140 to 200,000 a week. Approximately. I appreciate knowing that. I don't, I don't think people realize, you know, how you're restricted. It's not that you don't want to refer. You just don't have the, always have the financial ability to That's do true. so. That's true. Yeah. I appreciate. I really appreciate you sharing that with the, with council here. Yes, Councillor Austin. It's also uh, important to understand that not all tribes, uh, all different tribes, the way that different tribes have their budget <coughs> affects you. Like I know, if the monies that don't come straight to you through certain tribes, they actually go to other tribes and then come to you. I'm, I'm not describing that well, but it's got certain restrictions with the, some tribes. Yes. Self-governance uh, tribes, their funds uh, probably don't come to you, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. And so it, it, it does make it kind of an unequal pattern of, of how people's funding is. I guess a, a good question would be is on the tribes. We, what, we, you serve about 17 different tribes there? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, their budget is how much do they contribute to, to your overall budget? Does that vary as well? It varies, um, but one of, that's a good point. Some of the tribes have taken out a lot of their shares already, but yet <clears throat> their patients still come to the hospital, and, and we, don't, we don't turn them away. Well, that's not fair. <laughs> well, uh, you're right, but that, that's, that's the way our uh, program works. Okay. They pull the money out and still send patients there. Mm -hmm. 
George, I see where you had 57 uh, admission. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just to follow up on that a little bit, George. Now, are you saying some of the other tribes are only taking certain activities, right? Correct. Okay. They'll, so, take, they'll take some of their money out, yeah, yeah. but yet their patients... For certain activities that sure. they want to pay for to administer. Yes, sir. But still, I understand all natives are able to go to the office. Correct. Yes, so. sir. Okay. Yes. Well, I'm not sure we clarify that okay. because a lot of tribes are pulling bits and pieces out here and there. I yes. know that. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and do they administer those funds, the tribe themselves? Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Council? Yes, Councilor Shambaugh. Um, just looking at your the activity, um, things that were funded and things that were denied, and things that were deferred. Um, I know it's a money issue, mm -hmm. and you have approximately how much a month ballpark? We we end up <coughs> roughly one hundred fifty thousand a week. Uh, what are the, <clears throat> like there's 505 denials and 378 deferred, but what are, what are, uh, are you looking at mainly, um, I guess you'd say serious illness, um, uh, that takes precedence, I take it, um, but you're talking broken bones and things like that, or what, what is the majority of the denials that you think are, what kind of things are they? Because there's, there's more denials than funded. I mean, I just... Yes. Our, our, all the referrals that come through our system <clears throat> are reviewed by a uh, group, group of physicians, and then they're categorized and, and ranked by seriousness, and then we start paying with the most serious, and we pay till we run out of money. So there's, there's really no category in the def deferred and denied. Um, uh, we just we pay until we run out of money. Uh, based on based on those uh, providers <coughs> rankings of those uh, referrals that come through uh, yeah I I've had several calls uh, that you know people I think I addressed a little bit last month about people calling and <coughs> being scheduled for surgery next week and then they get a call the day before and saying that it's not going to be I mean it's set up and something fun and I know that we discussed this but that that, that still kind of just blows my mind that you know, you can be set up for surgery for something somewhat uh, serious, and then a day before, they're so sorry, we can, we can no longer fund that. You're going to have to pay for it yourself. I mean, that's that's difficult for people to accept, and they and they can't really understand it. And and it's really kind of hard for me to understand too. I know money's a deal, but <coughs> gosh dang, if you set it up and, and you don't do it, I mean, that's that's well that's difficult. <clears throat> part of our system. See, we. Climber, we, we run on kind of a hybrid system. <laughs> Cherokee Nation has a lot of the, has the outpatient money, and and um, so if a patient comes through and is they're going to outpatient appointments, those are going to all pretty much be paid because they go through the nation. If their surgery is going to be an inpatient <coughs> surgery, it's going to drop kick, get kicked back over to our system and go through our requirements. Um, where if it was an outpatient surgery, it would have stayed with the nation and been picked up 95% of the time. So, <clears throat> and I, I, I understand where, you know, where they've been going to all these appointments and the doctor says you need surgery and they get it scheduled. Because it's inpatient, it gets kicked back over to our, system, our side. <clears throat> and then once the doctors rank it, it's not, it doesn't meet priority to get paid. Does it matter if they have Medicare, or is that is that a? They factor? don't. We don't look at whether they have any resources whenever we we review these folks. They're they're reviewed on medical necessity and severity. So if if there was a case where something was very severe, and you were out of money, do you what do you do then? I mean, you just kind of out of luck, or I mean, do you try to refer them somewhere else? Well, if it's really severe, it's probably going to, the, the docs are going to rank it up high enough uh, in the order to get paid. If it's not, they, we still have the appeal process. They can appeal, and uh, Dr. Lang re reviews those every week. Okay. 
Right, if you if you have one that's specific you want to talk about. I, I will talk to you off camera about okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Councilor Crittenton. Yes, sir. Just while we're here, sir, we go back over like the tribe, the other tribes are picking what what were you can you go back over kind of what you're talking about there? Well, okay. Sure. The I won't pick, I'll pick on the Northeast tribes, but you know, they, they took a lot of their money, their outpatient money, and started the clinic. Well, we still have a lot of a lot of patients come down from the Miami area, the Missouri area. They come down and go and go to Claremore, but and we're not we don't turn them away. They come in for outpatient uh, services, and we're going to see them. They're ill. They're Ill. How's that compared to like the Cherokee Nation? Like, are we picking? It, it, it's hard to answer. Um, if you've got something specific, <coughs> I'll be glad to look it up and get get back to you, and, and I can tell you. Um, when you say these other tribes are picking, what are you? What was y'all talking about? Picking what? Well, for instance, maybe dental. If they take, and, and I'll and I'll I'll use I'll use Miami as an example. You know, the tribes up there took took their outpatient money out. Um, so, but yet I still have, say for dental, they took they took their money. I still have folks from from up there come down and go to uh, go to go through our dental clinic. We don't look at where they where they're from as long as they're eligible. <coughs> we put them in the system and we see them and treat them. Now the nation, do they do much of that picking? Cherokee nation. You guys have taken some programs. Uh, you've taken behavioral health. You've taken the WIC program, uh, public health nursing. And uh, and outpatient contract help, you know. That's interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In Georgia, I noticed you had 57 <clears throat> admissions for the month. Yes, adult. What? Yes. Wow, and that's down. Well, I guess that's good. And I noticed they're all Cherokee too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else have any further questions for George? <clears throat> George, thank you for being here today. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, Dr. Steve Jones. <coughs> yeah, they're going to give us a report. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <coughs> so, how are things going? Well, we'll uh, go over the report, and then I have a few guests that I'd like to have give a short presentation to some information that's pertinent to the group. Um, we'll start, we'll go through the report. Um, on the first page of your report, you can see the accolade there of being the number one e-prescriber. It's a little bit misleading because this is, this is only of Cerner uh, clients. So uh, <coughs> that is referring to of all the, the Cerner clients or the, the people that are using Cerner for an EHR, we're the number one e-prescriber. And uh, that's the reference that we're doing that for patient safety and, and efficiency reasons also to get away from. And it's also a, a change in the laws. So, uh, but we were ahead of the curve and, and we were recognized as being the, leading, the leader in that effort. Um, if you go on the second page, you'll see that uh, 6,807 patients were seen in the ED and our urgent care and emergency department. Um, Montgomery will reference that. We can set some new records in some of the shifts. Go on the next page, and you'll see that uh, you know, we talked a lot about contract health and dollars. And I think last year at this time, it looked like we were about uh, 12 million overspent, and we're starting off this year a lot better. Uh, we're doing some things to, to shore up that process, and, and a lot of that is uh, sometimes referrals are made, and we, we make those for the maximum amount, and then they reconcile as the year goes on, and you'll see that number shrink. But last year at this time, we were starting off at 12 million in the red, and we're at six this time, so uh, that number will shrink and, and look better as the year goes on, but that's why you see that in the red there. On the uh, approval rate, 97.5, that's up from 90, I think it was 96 last, last month. On the contract <coughs> referral approvals, uh, we'll go over to the next page on uh, patient visits. You'll see that every single clinic uh, increased on this report. Uh, there's a couple of things that that we feel like is driving that. Uh, 
One is the improved efficiencies that we're working on to increase access. And uh, the other is we have new contracts that incentivize uh, increasing access. So as you can see in this last, this last um, chart that every single clinic can increase their access and their appointments. And if we go over to the next page, um, again, the urgent care and emergency department left without being seen, even with record numbers, we still had a very, very low number of left without being seen. And that's, uh, I want to make sure that we give the accolades to that department. They've been working very hard the last few months. So. And then the last page, I want to point out, uh, Councilor Buzzard, we finally got the uh, process improved and fixed. So you can see that that, where those Ratios were inversely proportionate or now in line. I see. <clears throat> All right. And then I want to go over a couple of things that weren't in your report. Uh, number one, we have the um, accreditation that we've been working on for about a year for our family practice residency through ACGME. Uh, we got <coughs> notification last week that we were approved and we will have our residency starting in July of 2020. And that was for 24 residents. We'll, we'll pick up um, eight from Northeastern Health System as they get rid of their um, or moved out to move out of the family practice residency. And then we're going to have eight. I think we're going to pull in eight the new ones this year. So we'll have 16. Uh, but we're approved for eight each year. So each year we'll, we'll pick up a few more residents until we have a total of 24 in that program. So that was a big accomplishment. And Dr. Nolan and his group worked very hard to get us approved. Um, we have a couple, a new service line, which was um, speech therapy that goes along with our uh, accreditation for our stroke program for inpatient and outpatient. That's a new service line that we haven't had before uh, that all of our pediatrics department will be able to access as well as our inpatient for stroke. Um, and that started February 3rd. So we have a... Um, a uh, phone project working cu currently. We, we've had some issues with phone calls, and some of you may have questions for me, uh, where people have not been able to access the clinic and not getting callbacks. We don't know if it's a human error or if it's a technical error. So we're doing, uh, we've got a project where we have several people working on that to determine if it's something that we're not getting the messages or the messages aren't coming through. Uh, we're working on that currently, and I don't have an update for you yet on that. Some of it had to do with the 539 area code. We know we had some uh, some mobile uh, mobile company. Um, I'm trying to think of the, the company for sure that did not pick up that area code. So if you called from, I think it was Windstream, if you called from there, it wouldn't even go through. So um, we have been working with IT to get that fixed. I think that one is fixed now. Uh, but that is an issue that we've had with the 539 area code. Stillwell project, we've got the demo down on the old part of the building. Um, they're, they're waiting on setting a groundbreaking date and they're still hauling off all the demolition still. I think they're uh, on schedule to have that done in the next week or so. This is a big announcement that I want to make sure and get on TV is we don't have a waiting list for primary care providers any longer. We had a 25 Thank you. We had a 2,500 patient uh, wait list, or people on the waiting list, and that is now down to zero. Um, it takes about 60 to 90 days if you request a primary care provider on average. Some of our clinics are as short as two weeks. Uh, some of our clinics are as long as eight months. We're working on the ones that are on the other end of the spectrum to get that reduced and eliminate the obstacles that are keeping them from getting those primary care providers assigned. Um, along that line, part of the issue at the longer end of getting someone assigned is, happens at Muskogee. Um, we're working on moving the refill center to Tahlequah. When we do that, we'll open up that space for primary care, and that should help our access and get those times down. So uh, that project's ongoing currently, and we're hoping to have it completed by the end of summer. So. Um, and then I have a couple of people that I'd like to, with your permission, Madam Chair, to uh, bring up and talk about a few other Please issues. do. So first person I'd like to bring up is Lisa Hivick. She's our Senior Director of Public Health. You're all familiar with her um, as you have a subcommittee that meets with her, but she has an exciting announcement that I want to get out as soon as we could. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Good afternoon. 
I have um, some news for you that can I don't want to wait until the subcommittee to read because it's very important and um, I think it'll be very welcome news to some folks in the council for sure. Um, you remember the life expectancy study. I think it, since September of 2018, we've been dealing with this and trying to get to the bottom of what happened in the life expectancy study. Uh, Dr. Gannon and I have both told you about some discrepancies that we found. We've been working with the lead author from the study. Her name is Dr. Elizabeth Arias. And on last Thursday, I received an email from her that she has agreed I can share with tribal leadership. And public. Dear Lisa, thank you for your patience. We have been able to identify the problem. The one census tract with the very low life expectancy of 56.3 years, unfortunately, was assigned the majority of deaths of the two adjacent census tracts. This was a result of the geographic coding of PO boxes, which apparently are very common in these tracts. The deaths from the two adjacent tracks were coded to that one track. What we will do is combine the deaths and populations of the three census tracts and publish one life table. Each census tract will get assigned the same life table in the published data. I have estimated the life table and find that the life expectancy at birth for the three tracts to be 74 years. Yes. I will double check all numbers and estimation to confirm and then we will be able to release the new estimates fairly quickly. Best Elizabeth. Yay. I think, I think Councilor Crittenden's over there taking some deep breaths. <laughs> yeah. That is that is wonderful news. Thank you for coming to share that. My goodness, That's what a different. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Duncan here. Yes. Three miles away, too. Guys, going to leave. You think the Washington Post might run something on that? Um, I actually <laughs> mentioned, I actually, in my email to her prior to this last email, I mentioned that to her um, about that I was going to uh, talk to see if I could get to the Washington Post and have them run um, a story. As you know, the class from Stillwell has already contacted that author get, uh, from the Washington Post, too. Yeah, but they, I had, they hadn't read this. I had, they didn't have this piece of news. Well, a, sen a senior class at Stillwell High School has been doing a research project, the whole class on the life expectancy issue um, they started a podcast on it and then they were just on a radio station but Lisa come up out of her busy schedule and spoke to the class and I think cool. uh, kind of got them on a really good track so right. and that's I wanted to make sure you knew that and I didn't want it to wait two more weeks um, and Lisa uh, that is amazing uh, news I hope I hope you speak to the Cherokee Phoenix as well okay <laughs> but I mean what wonderful news for our people what well, wonderful news. I mean, as you said, we, we need to share it because that, that changes everything. And gosh, I appreciate you coming to share this before council. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Councilor Crittenden. Lisa, just thank you for your work that you always do. Appreciate <coughs> your, your department. <laughs> yeah. uh, I can't get over that, that Channel 8. No, not Channel 8. might have been 88. I ain't going to. But uh, they was uh, interviewing people in a funeral home. Oh. And, uh, yeah. And that his last tagline was, I hope it's not too late for the folks of... Maybe they'll do another story, too. Right. Yeah. right. But, I doubt it, though. But uh, <laughs> you guys always had your thumb on it. So thanks to your partner. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you Dr. Jones, you need to bring us that kind of news anytime. <laughs> well, Lisa and her team have worked very hard. They so, have, and um, we're grateful for it. We want to make sure it. we get that out as soon as, as, soon as we were able to. <coughs> that is awesome. Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, buzzer. All right, yes, so, Councilor Buzzard. Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, first of all, I want to uh, commend you on the revenue plus. That just looks a lot different from it did a year ago. So I'm going to commend your efforts of getting that done. Apparently, you've got uh, the right people working on those things. So I see it definitely improving on The other thing I just want to remind you that we don't want to forget the TVs and the signs there in Big Man. So, we've, yeah. got, we've got a project Thank working you. on that currently. Thank you. Thank you. So, if it's all right, Madam Chair, I'd like to bring Brian Hale. Sure. Um, I'm going to have Brian just give you a little update on, a, on an issue that you need to be educated on a little bit. I know Governor Stitt has been talking about block grants uh, with the Medicaid program uh, versus Medicaid ex expansion. So, I want uh, Brian's been doing a little research and been very active in that, and I want him to kind of give you a little update on that. Good afternoon, and thank all of you for you know, taking some time to listen to this. Give you a quick overview of Medicaid block grants. It's not nearly as exciting as Lisa's news, but we do think it's important. 
So I'll start off with a quick overview of Medicaid and Medicare, and then I'll talk about block grants in general, then we'll talk a little bit about Sooner Care 2.0, and we'll close out with what we think is important for you all to hear from the tribal perspective. So just, just to kind of get to the basics, Medicare and Medicaid are both government-run health insurance programs. Medicare typically focuses on adults age 65 and older, and Medicaid, generally speaking, takes care of low-income people. So Medicaid, its focus is on providing health coverage in both long-term or, or nursing home type care, assistance to the elderly, to the disabled, and uh, to pregnant women and children with low income. And more recently, that's expanded to include low-income patients across, across the board that don't have some other category. So it's important to remember that Medicaid is a joint program between the federal government and the states, with the federal government setting some broad guidelines for eligibility and benefits that a state has to provide. And the federal government spends about 55% of that budget, with the state then matching the rest of that. So states operate within those federal guidelines, but they do have some leeway in regards to eligibility and the benefits that they provide above that essential health benefit or that core set of benefits. So broadly speaking, Medicaid coverage is based on income. It is a means-tested means benefit, and it has income requirements, generally right around the federal poverty level. And so and it also covers disability, pregnancy, and then um, it also covers children within a certain income level. And while Medicaid provides health insurance to people with low income, it does a lot more. It takes care of people with severe disabilities, takes care of children with special health needs, and the elderly with Medicare, because many elderly, as you're aware, they may have Medicare, but they can't pay the premium. So Medicaid will help with those premiums because long-term care isn't a benefit that Medicare takes care of. So it's also important to remember that the roots of Medicaid are in the welfare programs. So its original intent is to take care of the low-income elderly, the blind, the disabled. The Affordable Care Act, however, kind of changed that and expanded that scope and so that it'll allow Medicaid to also take care of people that are only low-income and don't have another qualifying issue. So the Affordable Care Act expanded the availability of Medicaid, and one of the options for a state to expand its Medicaid program is a block grant. And so a block grant approach to expanding that coverage is where the state receives a fixed amount of funding from the federal government, and then the state then manages the program. The idea is that the state can be more efficient with it and can tailor it to meet its own needs. The concern with this, though, is that you could have a reduction of benefits or greater cost sharing by those recipients. The federal funding for the block grant is based on the state's previous spending on Medicaid. The state would receive its fixed amount from the federal government to cover that expansion population. And that's one thing that's important to remember. We're talking about the expansion population only. So the newly announced Healthy Adult Opportunity is a demonstration project intended to highlight the benefits of a value-based model that would grant states the flexibility to administer the program the way they see fit. And the idea is to maximize the health outcomes of those Medicaid populations while achieving cost reductions. One of the objectives of the Medicaid program is to provide medical care in a manner that makes uh, health care spending by the government sustainable. And to that end, the Healthy Adult Opportunity <coughs> Project allows flexibility on provisions such as retroactive coverage, eligibility, and cost sharing limits. And so within that proposal, it's mostly those newly eligible after the Obamacare Medicaid <coughs> expansion that would be impacted by those block grants. And that would include childless adults and and parents who are living uh, near the federal poverty level. Specifically, the plan that's proposed by Governor Stitt, which, we're calling, which he is calling Sooner Care 2.0, would be the way that Oklahoma expands its coverage. And so bear in mind that a lot of the details associated with Sooner Care 2.0 have not been shared, so we don't know a lot about how it's going to be, and we expect there to be possibly years before it's implemented because there will be legal and legislative challenges to its implementation. We do know that the intent is for it to be a managed care approach and that it would cap federal funds with the state's expansion population. And we don't know how they're going to fund it, whether it's going to be an aggregate spending model or a per capita cap. Sooner Care 2.0 would have work, work requirements as well as um, premium sharing or cost sharing. And I won't go into details, but I will remind you that 
you know, recently the state did have a ballot initiative and state question 802 is going to be on the ballot soon that would have a full Medicaid expansion. So that's important to remember as well. So the tribal considerations, the thing that's, that we think is important for you to understand is that CMS has made it clear, no matter what, that it expects states to continue to provide the tribal, po the tribal protections such as no cost sharing, no premiums for tribal citizens. And it will also continue the 100% federal medical assistance percentage or FMAP. And that's important to bear in mind because it's used to calculate the federal government's share of the Medicare cost of that state. So for tribal citizens on Medicaid, the eligible services that are provided to them, it still has a 100% match. And what that means is for a tribal citizen in the state of Oklahoma who's on Medicaid, there's no cost to the state. That is a 100% match from the federal government. And the Healthy Adult Opportunity Projects are also expected to continue the same government-to-government -government consultations with tribes that they've always had. So just also bear in mind that a tribal health system does not operate in a vacuum. It's important for us to have a robust, healthy health care system across the state of Oklahoma. So it's in everyone's best interest to make sure we have a good option for Oklahoma. And we do plan to continue to fully engage with the state of Oklahoma as they develop their plan to implement Sooner Care 2.0. And as we learn more, we're happy to share that with you. I think at the end of the day, the thing to take away from this is that the more people that are eligible benefits us. And if the state gets block grants, they may have the ability to decrease that eligibility. If they decrease eligibility, that may be more uninsured and more people that did not have the ability to get those services through the Medicaid program. So that's something that for this group, <coughs> needs to understand that. Councilor Taylor? Is it an either or situation for Medicaid and Medicare? Either the block grant or Medicaid expansion? The way we understand it, yes. It would be either a full Medicaid expansion, which is what State Question 802 is proposing, or the governor's plan, which <coughs> as it stands now, would be a block grant. And that question, would that be in November? He hasn't put it on the ballot yet. We expect it to be either June or November. That's all I have, Mary. Anyone else? Any questions? Councilor Buster. So, so what is your take on, on the House on the bill? Which would we rather see? It depends on how you look at it. If you're looking at it from a, from a revenue perspective or from a sustainability perspective. And I think the devil is in the details with this. And so we'll have to see how the details work out with the plan. We, uh, you probably don't want to give us the numbers. Do we have quite a few on uh, Center Care? Yes, sir. We do. So we collect, we bill Center Care for those bills now. Yeah, OK, well, that, that's something to think about. But, but we, we pass through, and we, it's a, the state doesn't match. Okay. For us, right. so, yeah. so, so you pay that. So where we benefit is the more people that are eligible, right. the the more we benefit on so that. The more you can benefit. Absolutely. That question, the answer that I'd say. Okay, thank you. Then. Anybody else with any questions for Mr. Hale here? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you Brian. <clears throat> All right, last but not least, I'm going to have Dr. Montgomery come up and give you an update on the coronavirus. That's in the news every day and. I'm sure that you're up to speed on it. Hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. On January 30th, I sent out an email to all of the uh, clinic medical records administrative staff regarding the outbreak of the novel coronavirus in China. You should know that our staff are, we have the policies in place, our staff have been trained, have the know-how and the capability to take care of a patient should one walk into one of our clinics, but we took some very specific steps that you may have heard about or seen. We alerted all the registration staff to ask some very directed questions, which is the best way to identify those patients at high risk. We also posted flyers at all the points of entry in the clinics, at the registration desks, in the emergency room and urgent care, again, asking patients to notify our staff if they've had recent travel to mainland China. Nursing staff reviewed all the policies that are currently in place, and we had the staff go through the patient flow exercises to follow in the event that a patient should walk in and be considered at high risk for uh, being infected with the novel coronavirus. With these things in mind, I don't think, I honestly don't think, a patient will likely walk into the doors of one of our clinics with what I understand and with the numbers that are out there now. There have been 40,000 confirmed cases worldwide, there have been 900 deaths worldwide. There have been 12 confirmed cases, and again, this is just as of my recent check before I came to the meeting, on the internet, 12 confirmed cases in the United States, but no deaths in the United States. 
Those cases in the United States have been in states far from Oklahoma, they've been California, Arizona, state of Washington, Massachusetts, but none in our surrounding states. Philosophically, what this, what this reflects is that we're a big planet, but with our ability to travel, <coughs> go from place to place, things like this were bound to occur. And uh, Dr. Gann showed me a very interesting graph just before I sat down. We have not seen the end of this. Most of these types of infections, there's a steady increase in the number of identified cases, and then there's a plateauing effect, and eventually they drop off. But there's no sign that this is slowing down. There will be a greater and greater number of people infected, and again, more deaths. But with the drastic measures that have been taking place so far in, in China, this has been relatively well contained. But there's a good chance that at some point, someone will sneak through the barrier, so to speak, and potentially spread that infection to a larger number of people in the United States. But again, I know we all hope and pray that that doesn't happen. And again, we all hope and pray that it doesn't happen at Cherokee Nation. But you should be reassured. Our staff are aware of doing the right thing. They have, we have the policies in place. They know what to do. Should a patient walk in that we consider at high risk. Any questions about that? Yes, Mr. <coughs> Crittenden. Yeah. Doctor, if uh, you have someone that came from mainland China, how how uh, concerned would you be? Is there a need for, you know, you don't want to panic, but is there some concern? There would be there? concern, and again, it would be, the next question would be, had they been around someone who had a recent fever and, and cough-like illness? And then when, was, when were they last there? Because there's this 14-day incubation period. If they had been to mainland China two months ago, it shouldn't be a concern, because they would have been sick by now had they been exposed to the coronavirus. Does that make sense? Yeah, good. Anyone else with questions? Yes, Councilor Shambach. Would you consider this a, a pandemic? Good question. And, and I'll defer to Dr. Gann about this. I think we're kind of on the border of saying that. Yes, sir. The um, <clears throat> pandemic has a lot more to do with geography. Um, the the 40,900 cases in China and overall in the world, and 40,300 were just in China. So um, highly contagious, mortality rate's not um, too scary, it's still about 2%. So not quite a pandemic, but you know, double, the World Health Organization is calling it uh, you know, a health emergency. Health emergency, yeah. Thank you. Well, I just knew that there was um, there's different protocol for things like that. I know I get a phone call every month about uh, from Oklahoma City in regards to emergencies, pandemics, and things like that, they're testing everybody's phone numbers to see if, you know, if we have to respond uh, to a robot call every month and for just these type of things. So I guess we or our hospitals do have these policies in in uh, effect in case something like this uh, would happen to break out in the U.S. Then yes, yes. Anyone else have questions for Dr. Montgomery? Just a little yes, follow. Councilor Crichton. Sorry. Sorry, and while we got a bunch of doctors here, so <laughs> what's the latest? Um, what are they doing for someone who <coughs> has it? Sorry if I missed the, that explanation earlier. I meant to include that. There is no treatment for it. There is no vaccine. The, the, the main way of the most important thing is isolating the patient, preventing further spread, <coughs> trying to treat them for the superimposed infection that typically is what causes their death, which is bacterial pneumonia. Uh, the, the virus weakens the immune system, work, weakens the lungs, and they go on to develop a more severe bacterial pneumonia, which uh, you would want to treat with ordinary or routine measures. So you can treat what this causes, but, can't necessarily but you can't treat the virus itself. No, there is no treatment. And the tests for it right now, there's no widespread test. We don't have a specific test in our lab. The Ooh. CDC only last week began shipping out these special kits to very strategic locations. It's not widely available. If someone were highly suspected, we would have to send specimens to Atlanta to the CDC for confirmation. And you, they, you guys are, of course, paying attention to when we could get those tests. And we would update you and certainly alert you if anything, anything significant <coughs> changes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And just one quick one. I should have asked this before, but what? Where did this come from? Is this something new? Is this a mutation? I mean, I mean, it just popped up. I mean, is this something it's, it's brand new? Thought to have spread from a, a animal source to humans, and again, that that hasn't been <coughs> definitively identified, but I think it will eventually be known. Okay. Right. Anyone else with questions for Dr. Mm -hmm. Montgomery? I, I, 
I have one. Uh, Dr. Montgomery, uh, it's not about uh, the coronavirus, but I would like to know, can you update us on the tramadol shortage? I was going to do that, too. If I may take one more step and just tell you, uh, we have had 28 patients. So what is currently causing our patients the greatest risk? Influenza. We've had 28 patients hospitalized testing positive for influenza. In the last week of February alone, we had 156 patients <coughs> for influenza. So again, we know historically the end of January, 1st of February is the highest instance of influenza <coughs> test positivity. So that's what we're being dealing with currently. There have been 24 deaths in the state so far due to influenza or influenza-related illness. So it's not too late to get a flu shot. If you haven't had it, please encourage people to. And as simple and simplistic as it sounds, wash your hands regularly, cover your mouth when you cough or sneeze. Those are important steps to minimize the risk of transmission. Um, the final thing, thanks for asking about the tramadol. I want to give Carrie Barrett, our director of pharmacy, a, a lot of credit for this. She has, for lack of a better word, scrambled to find other sources of tramadol. And right now, we've thankfully not had to deny or not be able to refill any prescriptions and we've been keeping up with the demand so again we're keeping up with the demand the manufacturer has not indicated yet that they're going to begin resupplying but uh, uh carrie's done a great job and the rest of the pharmacy staff and the numbers that we have currently look like we're going to be okay for the month of uh, february you know i have to say uh on behalf of the council how much we applaud you all in letting us be aware that this was uh, a possibility that was going to happen it's really nice when we know ahead of time and we learn from you rather than learn it on social media. And I'm, sure. I'm going to be really grateful for that. Thank you so much. Great report, Dr. Montgomery. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. <coughs> Councilor uh, Buzzer. Yes. Uh, and I know in our clinics, uh, Doc, that we have uh, masks for patients to put on. I don't know if you know about Do we have them here in the complex? Yes. Do we have them? Yes, they're at the store. And all the entrances as long as well as 8 cents. Oh, okay. I'm good. Good very good. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jones, anyone with questions for Dr. Jones? <coughs> Councilor Nofire. Did we, uh, I heard that uh, Northeastern Health System lost their accreditation. For their internal medicine residency. Okay. So that doesn't affect anything with our uh, joint venture that we have with them. <coughs> okay. That's just one of the questions. And then, um, Two questions I had from, from some citizens that asked, uh, is there, and I, I think it may be a security issue, but all the lights that are on on the new clinic during non-working hours, are those man mandatory that we have to have those on? Or is that, because I know that the energy cost savings might be in place if needed to be, but I, I just figured I'd ask. So that, that building is actually a, a lead silver certification. We've done everything we can to get as most efficient that we possibly can but yeah there are some security issues with certain lights that stay on 24-7 uh, so to speak and um, but most of the rooms that have uh, aren't essential will have um, motion sensors so if someone's not in the room and no gotcha. motions going on lights go off and when someone re-enters the room lights come back on a lot of those issues are are are, uh, are a lot of those things are put in place the the sun shades are on a sundial, so yeah. as the sun moves around, the shades come down to to keep the uh, building from heating up and just from the sun. So uh, there's lots of lots of unique things about that Smart. building that are make it as efficient as it possibly can be. Cool. And then the only other thing I heard was coffee. We start charging for coffee in the hospital. I'm Aren't not. charging? <laughs> are, are we charging for? I heard it was free, and then I, I had heard someone called me and said they're going to charge a dollar next month for the cups I, of coffee. I, they in the cafeteria initially they started off with uh, free coffee for, but it's not coffee like you're thinking where you have a pot and you pour it in. It's the machine where you select different types of oh. lattes and espressos and all those type of things. So dollars uh, a bargain. Yeah. yeah. They, they <laughs> I, thought, I, thought, I thought, well, we got free coffee at the casino, but now you got espressos and espressos. Yeah. And I didn't go over there for more uh, coffee. Just black coffee. It's, um, you know, it's one of the machines that they can select what type of coffee they want and flavored coffees. And um, a dollar is pretty cheap for that. Yeah. So. yeah. I appreciate it. Okay. We had the same complaint, and I bounced it off the chief of staff. And what was your uh, assessment of it, Todd? Same. We got this other alternative out there that's pretty cheap. So. <clears throat> okay. 
That's not a bad complaint. If that's the only complaint we have. Coffee. Right. I'll I take it. Encourage them. To move. <laughs> I said, now you can go a little ways down, go casino. Then that's free coffee. Yeah. <laughs> cool. go that. <laughs> Councilor Dobbins. Yeah, Dr. Jones kind of mentioned this. This uh, accreditation for family practice that we have, starting out with 16. That's 16 MDs and DOs already. They have a degree in in, uh, in a residency. That's a big deal. Yeah. What does that mean near term and long term in our for our system? Well, initially four of those will be third years and four of them will be second years and then the eight will be uh, first years. So the second and third years are already doing some rotations through our system and those will continue to expand as we expand more services. Um, they will still do some rotations at Northeastern Health Systems, some of the things that we don't offer as, as direct services. So we are working in cooperation with them to provide the educational um, requirements that the, that the residency requires. But it does mean better access. We have uh, our own attending physicians that will be overseeing what they do, and as they get further along in their education, obviously there's, there's more responsibility that they're allowed to do without just an attending. Very good. Anyone else with anything? Yes, Councilor Crittenton. Yes, um, just on that point, like, are those residency uh, doctors now, are they filling vacancies or is that no. in addition to? Addition. Yeah. Wow. And 2,500, um, when this administration, you took over, people were looking for uh, primary care? Right, having a, a primary care provider assigned, mm -hmm. the waiting list had got up to around 2,500, and you know the complaint that we kept hearing is it takes two years to get a primary care provider. But you, uh, you got that down to zero. Down to zero. Wow. It's wow. huge. Um, Congratulations. Yes. Now, Thank you. latest conversations. I'm still getting calls. I'm sure everybody else is about what are we doing to keep these folks creditors. From calling, I don't know if we could ever fix it, but what's the latest conversations? Um, I don't know the specifics. I know uh, Steve Carey's been working. He's not here today. He's out. You know, I should have prefaced that with yeah. I appreciate those guys because these individual <clears throat> things they have they've really helped me help folks. Yeah. So I should have said that. But but this I didn't mean to interrupt you. But so if you could visit with him, the latest conference. I don't know. Oh, I had a question about. So let's say, because I'm dealing with one in, in my family, thank God I, I don't know a whole lot about it because that'd mean people close to me were sick, I guess, if I knew a whole lot about it. But, but um, so do you send in, do you, I've got an anesthesiology bill that I've got. Now I've got this other bill, this other person that looked at my daughter, one of them just waved at her bill. So we got different bills coming in, different times. <laughs> now, before you, before Contract Health pays that, do you wait till you get everything, or do you meet? Do they meet the anesthesiology bill, pay that, or is there a wait time where all of it comes? It, in? it depends on how it's billed. If it's outpatient, it comes a little differently than if it's inpatient. So it depends on how it's billed, and and then Contract Health is currently working on an improvement project to get the timelines down and get those processes shored up. We're going to be aligning things a little differently on supervision, so hopefully we can get some of those things some of those things fixed where people aren't receiving uh, bill before contract health pays it if that's responsible for them, if it's our responsibility to pay it. Some of those cases are the people that's supposed to send that stuff. It is, and some of the cases are people who think that they are eligible for contract health that maybe they were not eligible for contract health and they're thinking Cherokee Nation should pick up the bill and maybe Cherokee Nation shouldn't pick up the bill. So those kind of cases fall in there too. Uh, and if they haven't been pre-approved or approved for that service, then there's an appeals process that goes that they can go through. And while they're in that appeals process, they may get a bill from whoever is you know, responsible for receiving money for that uh, treatment. So there are a lot of uh, different scenarios that can affect that whole process depending on where the patient is in that. If they've come to us and we refer them out and we've done, they've gone through the process correctly, then that shouldn't happen. But 
uh, there are scenarios that could happen where an appeal is going on and they think that something should be paid that maybe it, it doesn't fall within the guidelines. Okay. All right. So Does that make sense? I can tell them that you guys are working on it. Steve. Absolutely. And if they have a, a specific question, you can send it to Mr. Carey or myself and we'll make sure we get an answer for you. One other question, the pain. Uh, I have a friend who cut his finger off top of it and uh, he couldn't get any pain meds for that. Now, is that just something that because of the recent, you know, lawsuits, opioid talking about this and that, is that something that he would normally would have had a little relief from? Are we in kind of a the stage that we're kind of looking at this because it just didn't sound right? And it, well, as, it, as administration, we don't dictate any of those treatments to our providers. That's a, that's a provider specific question and how that's handled from that provider. There are rules that go along with, with how much they can prescribe and what happens once that they exceed those limits and how what the responsibility of the patient is and pain management past that point. And those are our laws that are dictated to the providers uh, through their licensure. So uh, that's something that would be a, a provider specific between that patient and that provider. It would not be an administrative question. And if so that's when the patient advocate comes in. Mm -hmm. If that patient didn't agree with what the provider being sent home with Tylenol. Thank you. And there may be a reason for that that you know it's it's for, you know it's between the patient and the provider. Okay, Councillor Smith. Just two observations. I eat out there at least at the clinic one or two times a week and food for the price is very good. Very good. Thank you. And then Dr. Montgomery had to eat a cold lunch the other day because he came down and got his lunch and one of the girls at the booth passed out and he stayed there with her until they got, got it going and everything. So he, ate, he had a cold lunch. <laughs> but, but the food's very good and the good. price. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. I heard, heard that Dr. Montgomery had, yeah, resuscitated a patient. Thank you, Dr. Montgomery. Councilor Shambaugh. I was going to ask a question, but we're low on time, so I'll just make a comment. I'll save it for another time. Um, Contract health process 10,006 referrals for just December. Wow, that, that puts things in perspective a little bit. I mean, 10,000 in one month. <coughs> and you kind of wonder, that's a lot of money. And there's a lot, so many different things. Uh, I had some follow-up, but we're low on time. But uh, that's, that's really amazing that, that what you guys are dealing with. Uh, from contract help. That's that's a ton of people. Huge volume. That's, and that is, and that's tough. And that group does a fantastic job. Uh, Mr. Carey does a fantastic job at, at uh, uh, managing that group, and we're in. You know, again, we're evaluating <coughs> that whole process, and we're going to get him some help to uh, some more people underneath him to help uh, distribute some of that load. And that was that. I'll just real quick. That's what I was going to say to one person. Uh, that's a lot of people. You know, I mean, those are that's a lot of load for one person. So. And we and we've recognized that, and we're just in that process of breaking down what we need, and making sure we're not overstaffing, but make sure we're not understaffing too. Okay. All right, thanks. Sir. Okay, I just have a couple of questions uh, on behavioral health, health, and help. Do they answer phones in the evenings or weekends? Uh, if it's after hours, there um, we advise people to take patients to the ER, uh, and they have a process there for getting behavioral health uh, help um, because we do have people on call through the ER so, so if it's a if it's a situation where someone is is needing help after hours then they can go to the ER and the ER has the means to to pull those people in on call very good and uh, are, is there any problem with operators scheduling appointments going on at this time not really we are having some phone issues, and that's what I was talking about earlier. We're working on a project to, to find out if that is a technical issue or if it's a human error issue. So uh, we are having some problems. We recognize that, and, and we're working on it currently. Okay. And on behavioral health, uh, what's available for an at-large citizen that can come into jurisdiction? Is there uh, anything available? Direct services are available to any citizen uh, right. as long as they come to our uh, place where one of our clinics. Uh, so yes, they're available to them, but they have to come to us. Are there any behavioral health units available that an at-large citizen within jurisdiction could attend or uh, be hospitalized for? 
we currently don't have anything in our system that is uh, that is inpatient. So um, all that is referred out to other <coughs> other entities. So okay, do you see that as a long range situation thing uh, coming? It's something we're definitely looking into, and we've got um, a couple of work groups working on different avenues of what makes the most sense for us um, from a um, financial and a uh, responsibility as well as an obligation to take care of our patients. Okay. And uh, when we start with the remodel on the hospital, do you see the addition potential perhaps for behavioral health there? That's one of the things that we're looking at, whether it uh, makes more sense to do renovation versus uh, look at a facility. So. Okay, and then uh, has anything been done about the policy on counseling when you get your drugs? So with pharmacy, we have looked at some different things and we've looked at it from an internal perspective. Um, and Ms. Barrett has some really good ideas on some things that need to change, but none of us are experts in that. So we've uh, looked for an outside consulting group that oh, does nothing but pharmacy. Um, we've got a letter of commitment with that group and as soon as the contract's signed we're going to be bringing them in to do a, a overall consultation with all of our pharmacies uh, across our system and give us the best practices as well as what areas we can improve in. That, that's really good news. Now listen, I want to tell you that great the provider rate, vacancy rate at 3.8 percent versus Indian Health Service provider vacancy rate 25 percent is that not amazing I mean we're obviously becoming the health care system of choice congratulations for all your all's work we really appreciate it thank you <coughs> anybody else with any questions take a motion for the meeting to adjourn An announcement yes uh, right. IHS uh, scholarship uh, program is going to have a rep in Tahlequah Wednesday at two o'clock at the web auditorium uh, that's for professional schools but also undergrad if you have a constituent or family member that's in college they can get an IHS scholarship and there's no service payback for undergrad but anyway that individual it's a one-stop shop Wednesday this coming Wednesday at 2 o'clock in the web auditorium Wednesday at 2 o'clock yes that's important that's really good news thank you for sharing that any other announcements Ten minutes. okay our next meeting scheduled for March the 16th I'll take a motion to adjourn Absolutely. have 10 minutes thank you Thank you.